and welcome to the November Patch Tuesday. I'm Chris Gettle, and joining me as always is Todd Shell. Todd, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Chris. Uh, I can't believe it's almost the end of the year already. Oh, it's crazy. Yes. It's flown uh, by. It absolutely is. And uh, we're, we're going to go through. There are uh, a few interesting things going on right now. Um, so we're going to go through and talk about the latest updates that have come out. So giving you an overview of what came out on Patch Tuesday. We're going to cover some recent news. Uh, a lot of what's going on right now is more uh, focused on uh, the recent releases, um, especially from Microsoft uh, and uh, some of the end of life. So we'll, we'll touch on a few things there. And then Todd's going to walk us through the bulletins and releases for this month in more depth. And then we'll wrap up, as always, with our Between the Patch Tuesdays, talking about all of the additional security-related updates that, um, that we've seen in the past few weeks. So without further ado, Microsoft was the headliner yesterday. There were some other updates out there, but nothing else of a major kind of security priority. Google Chrome did not have a security release yesterday. Todd, is that correct? We're still... We still did not see a security update from them this week yet. No, they did. They did release later in the day. Oh, they did. Okay, so yeah. we did get a security release from them. All right, I yep, did not catch that day. towards the end of the day. Yep. Um, so we had the seven updates from Microsoft, two of which were critical. We're going to talk through those, and then we've got the Google Chrome update, which did release later in the day, which means Edge should be um, dropping today, probably. Right. I don't think so. Typically, within 24 hours is usually when we see the Edge update come out. So Adobe did have several updates released, but they were all priority threes. So if you're not familiar with priority three from Adobe, um, they, they basically classify those as products that are less likely to be targeted by threat actors. And they, their guidance is for administrators to update at their discretion. So... Um, I would say, uh, you know, work those into your update schedule, but uh, they're not as high of a priority as some of the items we're going to be talking about today. We are going to touch on some uh, recent news here in just a moment. Uh, but before I jump into that, a couple of things about the user experience uh, for the platform here. You're going to see a doc section and a Q&A section. I see several people are already using that Q&A section actively. So thank you for posting your questions there. We do have um, several of our team here already answering questions on the fly as we go through. And Todd and I will be responding to several questions that are more audience-wide um, vocally throughout the, the presentation. So please do feel free to use that Q&A section and we will respond to your questions there. Under the docs section, you will see a copy of today's slide deck available in there. So as we go through, if you wanna grab any of the news links or related articles and uh, um, knowledge base articles that we're going to be talking about. They are all in that presentation. So go ahead and download that now. That also makes, makes it so that you don't have to wait for the, the follow up uh, uh, notification to come out after today's presentation. You can get access to that right away. As I know, several of you take that information directly into your change control process. So grab that now while uh, you're thinking about it and make sure you get a copy of that. There's a couple of other assets in there. If you want to grab those, those are just uh, talking about um, our cyber risk uh, uh, survey that was uh, um, ran out earlier this year, uh, information about our attack surface management solution, a few other uh, key things in there if you want to grab those and take a look. Um, but the, the presentation is definitely one that uh, you can take a look at there. All right, so you should now see uh, the links that I'm going to be going through here real quick. The next couple of slides We'll, if you're following on the presentation here, we're gonna go through a couple of slides of content here, and then we'll jump back over to the presentation. The first one is, if you haven't already heard, Windows Server 2025 is now released and available. So uh, be aware that's out there. Um, many of you may have already been starting to investigate. Some of you may have uh, already had some upgrades happen whether you wanted to or not. So there's been a little bit of news about that that we'll talk uh, through in just a moment here. Um, but it's got information about what's new in 2025, uh, in, in updates and uh, enhancements that they've got to uh, the platform. One of the things that you may be seeing news about is around what they call hot patches for Windows virtual machines. Um, so for customers running in Azure, uh, if you're running uh, um, out there, you're going to be seeing this 
and it's got details about how the hot patching works. Um, this is to give um, some quicker response to um, security hot, uh, hot fixes and hot patches that uh, you, you may want to take in more quickly, especially for virtualized environments. These updates are included in the next cumulative. Um, so if you're doing the cumulative update model, you're going to be getting these as well. But this is just something that Microsoft has broken out separately in the Azure Update Manager. Uh, so that's the difference between those, those hot patch updates. For those of you not using Azure, uh, again, those are going to be included in the CUs. But uh, this is giving um, you know a, a breakout of those update packages, uh, especially the Windows security updates, uh, so that they can be installed faster. Um, requiring you to, without requiring you to restart your machine. So that's something that uh, has been a new feature added there. Additionally, for those of you who may have seen some news articles about this or possibly been impacted by it, there was a lot of buzz recently about Windows Server 2025 automatically upgrading. Um, now, Microsoft was rather silent at first and rather defensive shortly after and then did acknowledge that some there was a misclassification of that update, but really it was in a, a, how you may be delivering your patches to your environment. If you were using um, WSUS or Windows Update and had it configured to do optional updates, or if you were using a third-party tool that rely, relies on Windows Update um, or WSUS under the hood, those are the areas where people saw an unexpected upgrade to server 2025. So there's a couple of articles here that talk about uh, what people were encountering. Um, there, there are a few vendors that were called out specifically depending on what articles you look at. I'm less concerned about you know uh, identifying that and more just about helping you understand what was causing this so you can go and make sure that it's not going to happen again. Um, but there is an optional update uh, flag or tag that's used in uh, in products that are using um, that form of Microsoft update model. And that's where the problem was coming in. So that deployment option for optional installation, the update was flagged, or the Microsoft upgrade was flagged as an optional installation and it was getting triggered in those cases. So it talks about the, um, the, the situation and gives you a little bit of understanding of, of what's going on. Um, a couple articles relating to that, uh, slightly different in their write-up, um, but I provided a couple of different articles there. It's easy to find a number of other ones. There's a lot of other articles though that were not, not as accurate as they could have been. Um, so these were two that actually gave a fairly um, concrete representation of what really happened. Um, that's why I included these two. So um, so that's the the update around server 2025. Um, an additional bit of news that's been going around was Amazon hacked. The Amazon and a few other vendors are continuing to get impacted by the reassur uh, resurgence of the Move It um, exploit uh, exploits kind of going around. So um, just be aware that there is a number of additional incidents that have occurred. Um, several large uh, organizations that were hit by this, and it was including. Uh, um, a critical SQL injection vulnerability in the MoveIt software. So that's something where if you do have MoveIt, again, it, many of you are probably painfully aware of that already. If if you are using MoveIt, if you haven't been keeping up with that, make sure that you've uh, uh, touched base on what version of MoveIt you're on and get up to the latest again if, uh, if you are using that so that uh, this resurgence of uh, targeting that product is not going to impact you as well. Um, according to the articles that I followed up on, Amazon was not directly hacked. It was actually a third party. So again, kind of reemphasizing the third party um, uh, supply chain concerns within organizations, making sure that you're keeping up with um, your vendor risk management and ensuring that those vendors are keeping up to date with uh, security concerns within their organization. Um, so that's that's the latest news there. Again, it's more a focus on MoveIt than any of the specific brands that were impacted there. Uh, if you are using MoveIt, make sure to keep tabs on that. And I would say 
uh, move it in general should be um, on your watch list for you know the the foreseeable future here any security issues that come up there you'll want to try to respond to quickly because there is a uh, um, one or more focused threat actors who are continuing to target that so it's kind of a high risk um, uh, a high priority uh, product to keep tabs on for right now all right we're going to jump into this month's updates of note the first one is the um, we're, we're going to go through the ones the the two microsoft updates that were exploited um, in the wild and then we're going to talk about the publicly disclosed this first one was both exploited and publicly disclosed um, it's the ntlm hash disclosure spoofing vulnerability uh, so this vulnerability does affect um, all of the windows editions so windows uh, 2008 and later uh, for uh, both server and workstation editions, including the latest. So both uh, um, Windows 11 24H2 and server 2025 were impacted by this vulnerability as well. So uh, make sure that the OS updates this month are your highest priority. In this case, this vulnerability allows the attacker to um, disclose the NTLM v2 hash that's used to uh, basically be able to impersonate that user to authenticate as that user. Uh, so in this case, the, the real concern with this one is a very minimal level of user interaction is required to exploit this vulnerability. If you look at the interaction side here, the selecting of that malicious file, so a single click, a right click to inspect it or look at its properties, any additional actions uh, without even opening the file could trigger the vulnerability. Um, so this one is, is definitely a bit more dangerous. Um, it's probably a little bit harder to exploit, which mean, er, which is probably attributing to why the CVSS score is lower. Um, but again, because this is already being exploited, you should be ignoring the severity and uh, CVSS score and prioritizing this higher from a risk perspective. This has been publicly disclosed the code maturity is functional um, so again the availability of this for other threat actors to use is at a higher risk as well so we may see some continued exploitation of this vulnerability so that's the first one the second vulnerability that is actively being targeted is a vulnerability that's an elevation of privilege in the windows task scheduler also rated important cvss in this case was a little bit higher in 8.8 .8. Um, the again code maturity here is functional we know that there's um, actively uh, exploited uh, cases out there in this case an authenticated attacker would need to run a specially crafted application on the target system to exploit the vulnerability and it would allow them to elevate their privileges to a medium integrity level an attacker who successfully exploits this could execute rpc functions that are restricted to privilege accounts only so um, it, that's that's where the the real danger in this one is is being allowing them to start to execute RPC functions in that um, restricted um, uh, state. In this case, again, we've got uh, um, Windows 10 and uh, later, so all of the Windows 10, Windows 11, including the latest uh, 21H2 or 24H2 and uh, Server 25 are affected by that. So the majority of your OS updates this month have two known exploited vulnerabilities being resolved by them. So that puts the OS update this month as your highest priority. Now we're gonna move over into the two publicly disclosed vulnerabilities. Um, the first one of these is around Active Directory certificate services. It's another elevation of privilege vulnerability, uh, rated important, 7.8 CVSS score. Um, in this case, it has been disclosed but it looks like code uh, like sample code was not part of that disclosure so no publicly available code exploits are available um, or pocs uh, so that reduces the risk here a little bit what i wanted to call out for this though is even after applying the update there's additional recommendations that microsoft has provided here so this article around securing pki technical controls for securing pki goes in depth on um, talking about some of these other things that you should be doing to clean up your um, certificate templates 
and reduce security concerns and risks around your certificate authority. Um, so take a look at that additional guidance as well, um, you know, and make sure that you're you're taking steps to to do that additional cleanup. So that is the certificate authority. The um, oh, and that by the way is affecting all of the Windows Server editions. So not a workstation concern, but Server 2008 all the way up through the Server 2025 um, are affected by that publicly disclosed vulnerability. Last Microsoft CVE we're going to talk about here is around Microsoft Exchange Server. It's a spoofing vulnerability, um, important CVSS score of 7.5. In this case, the disclosure did release proof of concept code. Um, so this does put the vulnerability in this case at a lot higher risk of being exploited. Um, you know, we've seen uh, it's been a little while since there's been a huge campaign against Exchange but uh, we've definitely seen some pretty nasty exchange server vulnerabilities over the past couple of years. I think this one is running a high risk, um, especially with the fact that there's proof of concept code out there for this. Um, in this case, uh, you know, make sure to get this update uh, applied as soon as possible um, for you if you're running exchange. Um, there's also some experience changes that you'll wanna be aware of as you roll this out. Um, so from what I saw from reports, if you're running Exchange online, you would not have seen this change, but in the on-prem Exchange, this is definitely going to be a behavior change in there. So after applying this update, it's basically changing the behavior of how P2 from header verification works. If that verification now is seeing the malicious behavior that's been flagged now, your emails could start to show up with this new banner being added. So the default experience after applying the November SU to Exchange on-prem is that you're gonna to start to see this banner if there's suspicious activity going on. There are additional configuration changes you can make to add some routing rules to this. So instead of just having that little banner tag post up there, cause I mean, even with that posting up there, there's a chance somebody's gonna to continue to read on, see something and click on it. Um, so the additional um, configuration options here allow you to do a couple of things. One, you can um, add routing rules to go and outright reject the email if it contains that header. So, okay, we're just going to take a hard line, anything that looks like it's abusing that P2 from um, header verification, just deny those, reject those messages. Um, there is an option to override this behavior as well. So I would say, consider doing the first one. If you're looking at a reason why you need to do the second, be very um, uh, you know, aware of the additional risks that uh, you could encounter there. So it's opening you up to additional phishing risk within your organization if you choose to override these new settings. Um, so that's a couple of additional configuration options that you need to be aware of if you're gonna do that. But the underlying guidance here is this month, the OS update is your top priority. For those of you running on-prem exchange, I would say don't waste time on uh, delaying the exchange uh, update. Start investigating that as soon as possible because uh, it does look like it could be, um, it could open up to a, um, a targeted exploit in the, in the near future here because there's POC code available. Um, so that is the lineup of Microsoft updates. On the Ivanti side, there is a, a set of uh, Ivanti updates that have been released this month. Our uh, security advisory is available on our blog. It talks through the three different updates that were released, um, Ivanti Endpoint Manager, Ivanti Avalanche, and then on the network security side, the Ivanti Connect Secure, Policy Secure, and Secure Access Client. Those are the products that were updated. Um, there was a total of around 50 CVEs resolved across all the products. Um, the, I think Avalanche had six and then EPM had several and the network security products had several as well. Um, but, uh, no evidence of any exploits being targeted against these vulnerabilities right now. Um, there are some critical vulnerabilities being resolved in the EPM and the, uh, network security side. So for those two products, definitely a higher priority on, on those. Um, but, uh, these are just security, regular security updates, uh, making sure that we keep up 
with uh, maintaining our CISA Secure by Design pledge. So from a uh, Linux perspective, there's two uh, um, areas that we wanted to point out here. Uh, for those of you who keep tabs on the Linux side, you may have seen a significant increase in the number of kernel CVEs that are being identified. Um, this can be attributed to the, um, the fact that the kernel project team has become an official CNA. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of fixes that were happening before may have been flying under the radar and hadn't gotten an official CVE unless they were captured in another CNA's activities. With the Linux kernel team becoming a CNA, you can expect to see more kernel level C, uh, CVEs in the Linux side. Um, so a couple of good, a uh, couple of things about this. One, yes, it's going to look alarming at first, um, but I think that uh, the reality is there's not a significant amount of new vulnerabilities being discovered. We're just now going to be better aware of the vulnerabilities being discovered and resolved um, because they're tracking it better as being a CNA themselves. Um, two, with that additional visibility, we're going to be able to make sure to keep Linux kernels more secure. So in this case, it's a very good progression for the Linux kernel uh, project kernel team um, that uh, uh, is going to give a lot better visibility to the market and make sure that you've got the, um, the information needed to, to move quickly on resolving kernel vulnerabilities. So the immediate advice is make sure that you get your Linux kernels updated um, with this higher visibility for all of us. That also means that threat actors are going to be more tuned into this and may start investigating more of those CVEs as they're identified because um, they have less work to do if, if there's more information available as well. Um, but it, it definitely is something where we expect the rate of kernel vulnerabilities being uh, disclosed to increase. Um, so just keep an eye on that. That's why you're seeing such a, a shift in the number is because they've become a CNA. The second vulnerability that we're going to talk about this month is CVE 2024-6345. It does affect all Linux operating systems hosting Python-based applications. Um, so a bug in, the, um, uh, in a Python package was widely uh, used and uh, has a vulnerability in it. The, if these functions are exposed to user-controlled inputs such as package URLs, they can execute arbitrary code on the system. So it's a uh, arbitrary or remote code execution vulnerability. Um, due to the way Python applications are packaged and distributed, it's often difficult to identify specific component usage prior to actually deploying the package. So that's where the guidance is. Um, update on all Linux operating systems wherever you're running Python-based applications because it, it may be difficult to identify which are using uh, certain components of Python and which ones are not. Uh, so the information update to the package version 70.0 or above um, as available on your Linux platforms. All right. <clears throat> Servicing stack updates. There's no new SSUs this month, but there were a lot of development tools being updated. So uh, if your development teams are using a variety of diff these different tools, make sure to take a look at those and ensure that those are being kept up to date. We talked about this last month, but this is the first month where the Windows 11 Home and Pro 24H2 um, it has uh, released and uh, it is being supported there. So there's an additional security update for that. Um, the, let's see here, we had uh, um, also the Windows 11 Enterprise and Education Edition 24H2 is available there. So these are just the uh, additional updates there, no end of lives this month or in the near future here. So um, looks like we're probably good until late 2025 on yep. end Looks of that Yep. So yeah, I just highlighted and, those two because they came out last month, Chris. That's all. Yep. Yep. So no, nothing, nothing new this month. Just a uh, awareness that uh, the new 24H2 is available. Same thing with 2025 that just released. So um, no immediate end of life right now, though. Okay. Todd, over to you for the bulletin updates. Okay, thanks, Chris. 
Hello, everyone. Let's walk through what uh, Microsoft released yesterday. We saw the Windows 11 update come out, of course, as usual, uh, and included the Server 2025 updates as well. Um, you can see that under the KB articles, they do lump some of these together uh, because they have a common operating system kernel, of course. Um, there were 35 vulnerabilities addressed across the Windows 11 operating system updates. Um, Chris talked about these four CVEs in particular, um, the one that's known publicly disclosed and exploited, the one that's exclusively exploited, and the ones that are publicly disclosed. So just call them out in there, highlight them in red for you if you want to go through and look at all the CVEs that were addressed. Obviously, going to the security update guide gives you a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of details on all those CVEs. As far as issues go, there was only one new one introduced this month. Um, the open SSH issue uh, showed up. Um, there is a issue where it, the service fails to start following the update from last month. Um, kind of be aware of that one. Um, the temporary workaround, and the reason it's not starting is because it has the wrong permissions on the folder where the service is trying to run from. Um, they do give kind of detailed instructions in the KB if you are running into this issue on how to go through and reset those uh, ACLs, um, obviously for those folders. So be aware of that one. Uh, you might run into that if you're if you're trying to run OpenSSH on your systems. Uh, the other one has been around for a while now, basically since 24H2 was introduced. Um, this Roblox program has a problem running. Um, they want you to download it directly from the vendor. So just be aware of that one. Also on 24H2 there. Windows 10, um, usually there's a huge difference in the number of vulnerabilities introduced or addressed between Windows 10 and Windows 11, but this month there's just one. So 36 vulnerabilities um, compared to the 35 for Windows 11, uh, the same CVEs um, as publicly disclosed and known exploited, so highlighted them there for you. Interestingly enough, no known issues reported for Windows 10. I don't know if I've seen that since I've been here, since we've been doing this, so it's been a long time. Um, so they did not publicly report any issues around Windows 10. As Chris mentioned, we did see an update for Exchange Server. Um, there was one publicly disclosed vulnerability, um, the 49040. Uh, Chris called that out specifically, so kind of be aware of that one. Um, you know, the, the updates do address both versions, or I should say three versions of supported Exchange Server 2016 CU23 and Exchange Server 2019 CU13 and CU14. So all of the currently active supported versions got updates. If you're running Exchange Server, you wanna go in and take care of those right away. We did see an update for SQL Server this month. A uh, large number of vulnerabilities, 31 vulnerabilities. They are all remote code execution type vulnerabilities. So you wanna go in and take a look at these. There's, you know, I thought maybe there was kind of a common type of vulnerability, but no, these are these are all over the place as far as how they can be exploited for remote code execution. Um, interesting to go in and take a look at these. Um, the did provide updates for all of the, you know, the generally distribution release, the general distribution lease, the GERs, as well as the cumulative updates for all versions of SQL Server that are currently under support. So again, 31 vulnerabilities addressed this month. Nothing that's known, exploited, or publicly disclosed, which is nice. But, uh, you know, for those of you running SQL Server, and a lot of us are, make sure you get this update uh, distributed this month in Patch Tuesday. We did see uh, Office updates, of course. They addressed eight vulnerabilities this month. Um, they were of two types. Uh, there was a remote code execution series of vulnerabilities. There were actually, I think, seven of those. And they um, all have to do with the graphics aspects of Windows uh, Office. And then there was one security of a bypass vulnerability around Office Protected View. Um, so if you want to go in and read about those, you can see those in the uh, update guide as well. Again, eight vulnerabilities addressed this month in the on-premise versions of Office. And the same vulnerability set were also addressed in the 0365 or the click to run versions as we call them. Um, same set of vulnerabilities again. You can dynamically update these um, on the fly with the click to run process. Again, rated important. None of these were publicly disclosed or uh, known exploited. This was kind of an interesting one. You'll notice on the update for SharePoint Server, we have no CVEs listed and we have no rating on this because of there are no CVEs. Um, Microsoft explained in their description on the vulnerabilities page of the security updates guide that they included 
the updates uh, for SharePoint Server in there, even though there are no vulnerabilities. They are covering it under their general defense in depth update. Um, interestingly enough, if you go in and read that, there's actually not a lot said in there other than, hey, you know, we've addressed a lot of issues. Uh, we're covering this under our defense in depth. We're not calling out any specific CVEs, but they do recommend that you go and apply this update for SharePoint Server this month. Again, covering all three supported versions, uh, the subscription version, the enterprise version, and the, um, the normal SharePoint Server 2019. So be aware of that one. Kind of interesting. Haven't seen this one before where you have no rating. But you definitely want to get that distributed this month. So that takes care of the releases from Microsoft for Patch Tuesday. Let's talk about between the Patch Tuesdays. This was a very busy uh, time since October Patch Tuesday. We did have Oracle release all of their Java updates as well as their other application updates. We did include those a uh, list of those here in, in the listings for this month. Uh, on the Windows side, we do break them out according to up security updates where the vendors provide a list of CVEs, and I have a list of those coming up here in a second. Um, we do have others. We lump them into security updates without CVEs, whereby the manufacturers let us know that they have introduced some security fixes, but they haven't been tied or they don't want to report the specific CVEs. And then, of course, we have the non-security updates as well, where there are either performance enhancements or other type uh, updates for the month. Um, getting into the details, uh, we did see updates for AutoCAD uh, 2025 there had 15 vulnerabilities addressed. Um, we did see an update for VirtualBox. And by the way, I list the CVEs here and I load these into the slides for everyone. If you want me to continue to, con to see the CVEs or if you just want me to list like, hey, this fixes 13 vulnerabilities, that would be fine too. Uh, let me know if, if this is useful or if you actually use this information. I know it's also embedded in our products. Um, when you go and look at the patches themselves. Um, as you know, Google Chrome is being released weekly these days with a security update. So you can see throughout the month here, these are the various releases of Chrome that came out. Uh, Firefox as well. Uh, there was a major update to 132 where they addressed 11 vulnerabilities there. Obviously, Firefox is continuing to support their extended security versions as well. Uh, we did see an update for Foxit PDF Editor this month that addressed uh, 21 vulnerabilities. So if you're using that product, you definitely want to update that. And also the PDF Reader Consumer version, very similar, also addressed 17 vulnerabilities. Obviously, a lot of overlap between the 21 for their other products. Here we get into the updates that came out for Java uh, and the third-party support of Oracle Java. We have Azul Zulu. Um, you should also be aware, if you're not, that there are actually um, four long-term service channels of, of Java being supported these days, version 8, 11, 17, and 21 right now. Um, there is, I think I have seen version 22 and 23 out, but those are not long-term service uh, commitments just yet. So anyway, getting back to the products themselves, you will see updates for all four of these. Um, there were eight vulnerabilities addressed in the Azu Zulu product. For all, all of them, they're actually the same vulnerabilities as I was putting this together yesterday. Um, in Java Development Kit, also, they, were, they only address six of the vulnerabilities uh, there uh, for whatever reason. Uh, again, all four versions there, you'll see the Java Development Kits there. Um, version 8 still supports the JRE as well as the JDK versions. So again, those same six vulnerabilities. Amazon's product, Coretto, only included four of those vulnerability fixes in their product. So you'll see all four of those there. And finally, Red Hat OpenJDK. Um, I think I only included the 21 version here. Need to take a look at including the others here. But again, they address the five vulnerabilities. Again, this is on Microsoft. On the Apple side, we did see operating system updates in the last month. I have those here on the next slide, as well as a number of third-party applications that included CVEs. Um, we didn't have any security updates that we saw in our list that we maintain, uh, but there were a lot of non-security updates this month. Uh, by the way, we've been continuing to expand our Microsoft, I mean, our, our Apple catalog. Um, we added VS Codium this month and a few others. So for those of you who are using any of our products with uh, Apple, we are continuing to expand the catalog there. As I said, uh, operating system updates this month, we saw all three of the currently supported versions, Ventura, Sonoma, Sonoma, as well as Sequoia get updates, 43, 46, and 59 vulnerabilities respectively. 
Uh, we also saw a standalone update for Safari version 18.1 for Ventura and Sonoma. So you can update that separately. Generally, they're included in there, um, but they're, this is also available as a separate update. Only four vulnerabilities addressed there. On the third party side, um, just like with uh, the Windows side, we do see Chrome updates across the board. Again, those uh, weekly updates there. Firefox as well on the browser side, both the regular and the extended security update version. Uh, and Thunderbird, their uh, mail program as well. So they have that included with the regular updates. You can see here, um, some of the only just single vulnerabilities that were addressed, but when they updated to version 132, they did include those 11 vulnerabilities that were also associated with Firefox, the browser side as well. And finally, um, we do run Microsoft Edge on Mac OS, so you will see those updates as well. Uh, regular updates throughout the month, nine vulnerabilities addressed back on the 18th of October, uh, then three and two respectively later in the month. So that's kind of what happened between the patch Tuesdays. So like again, I said, uh, a lot of updates, make sure that you're keeping up with the most critical of those. And with that, Chris, let's go take a look at what questions we might have out there. Yeah, we've been responding to several, but there's probably a couple that uh, um, there was some good feedback on uh, the CVEs, whether to keep them on the slides or you know splitting them out. And so inclusion of the CVEs in the PDF is appreciated for searchability. Um, a couple of comments there. So that's something that Todd and I will take a look at and incorporate going forward um, based on you guys' feedback. So thank you for that. Um, there was some questions around 24H2 and some of the setbacks and everything that have been happening there. We, Todd and I can give you know some guidance around this, but we we definitely can't make you know re definitive recommendations on this. I think it's one where each organization has to determine you know the benefits versus the deficits for moving forward to 24H2 in its current state. Microsoft did make some pretty significant changes in 24H2. Um, there's some some definite goodness in there. Uh, there's also, we've seen a number of reports from organizations of uh, just behavior and stability concerns. There was another question about the number of uh, ways that 24H2 was blocked from being able to upgrade on your systems. And I, uh, I, I did look at a, a few things there. There was um, uh, a number of compatibility issues that Microsoft had in such quantities that they basically put in detection for and we're deliberately blocking upgrade paths for many devices to to move to windows uh windows 11 24h2 um, so i think at this point in time my initial guidance would be um, approach with caution you know evaluate uh, and make sure that it's stable enough for you know rolling out to your organization or just keep it into a, a smaller group for the time being to continue evaluating um, as far as the blocks are concerned, Microsoft has resolved and removed a few of those blocks. But this, this transition has definitely had a bigger impact. A lot of older hardware is not going to be eligible to move forward. So that's where Microsoft has um, you know, identified the fact that they're going to provide a Windows 10 ESU path starting next October. So for those of you who have a number of systems that are blocked from moving to Windows 11, that's going to be the case. You should definitely start evaluating um, either hardware refreshes or a potentially less costly path, which is to get the ESU subscription. Um, depending on your license level, it may be included, um, but evaluate that and determine you know, prior to October 2025 if you need to do the extended support for Windows 10. Um, but yeah, definitely there's a lot of contention over, um, you know, we're at a critical point in technology evolution. The, uh, you know, I had, there was another question about Copilot, we'll get to in a second, but the uh, increase in AI's, uh, uh, you know, solutions onto the, the platform is increasing, um, you know, d impacts on, you know, hardware. So hardware definitely does need to be at a certain level to move forward to Windows 11 and later. Um, the, there's just a number of things that are evolving at this point in time. So 24H2, 
has a certain threshold that is uh, also just a, a matter of the next evolution in technology impacting at the same time. Um, so I do think there's a few things to, to look at and evaluate depending on your organization's needs. Um, so yeah, it, I would say, uh, again, if you, if you know you have a number of machines that are blocked from moving to the latest Windows 11 editions, definitely look into the Windows 10 extended support and start budgeting for that now if you know that you're going to have hardware that's going to need to continue running on it for the next few years. Uh, Microsoft is expected to do at least a three-year ESU cycle for Windows 10 as they've done for um, you know, the Windows and server editions that have end of life before that. So um, that's probably the best guidance I can give around that for right now. Copilot touch on that uh, as well here. There was a, a, com a comment about um, today's update installing Copilot on uh, their Windows 10 uh, test machine. Um, so Windows 11, definitely it's just part of the, the um, going to be part of the OS experience going forward. We're going to see more and more of those type of capabilities. There's definitely some ways to, um, uh, there's, You'll have to look into seeing how you can disable certain things like that, but um, Microsoft is definitely incorporating that as part of the Edge and Windows experiences. Um, that's just, I think, going to be something that we have to expect. So really, it's more of a matter of if you need to lock that down, you should be looking for ways to disable it. You may not be able to control it getting onto your systems, but controlling access to it may be the only course you have there. If anybody did miss the um, the kickoff of the meeting, they're uh, in the docs section. You'll have access to the PowerPoint presentation, and we will be uh, sending a follow-up email later on here today. With uh, it'll have links to the on-demand as well. So if you did miss some of the earlier part of the presentation, if you joined us late, you'll be able to get that there. Regarding Exchange, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the Exchange update. For those of you, I think the biggest thing is if you're running on-prem Exchange, that you definitely want to look into getting the update uh, applied as soon as possible. If you're running Exchange online or some other type of hosted Exchange service, you would want to follow up with your provider to see if there's any actions you need to be taking there, um, especially around uh, you know the behavior. I'm expecting that the reason I, I, I read this on Reddit and there wasn't a lot of detail about it, but somebody was saying that on Exchange Online, they were not seeing that new banner coming through on Exchange On-Prem, they were. My expectation is the Exchange Online probably took the next step of not only doing the update, but also um, rejecting those emails versus um, letting them through with the banner on them. So those are some things that you may need to investigate depending on what type of exchange solution you're running. Uh, but if you're running on-prem exchange, that's where those of you who are doing that, make sure to get testing on the, the latest update as soon as possible and get that resolved um, as quickly as you're able, because I do expect there's a, a higher risk of exploit of that, that um, update that was resolved this month. <laughs> Let's see, Todd, anything else that uh, you're seeing that we need to cover for the audience? I think that covered most of what I was seeing. Yeah, I'm glancing through here, Chris. That's all I see, too. Most of it was on the use of 24H2 and kind of yeah. our recommendations where I saw a lot of that. Yeah. Whenever we go through, I mean, some of the, the branch upgrades were pretty minor changes, and you could roll mm -hmm. right through them. 24H2 is a significant one, so... I, yeah. I think the biggest thing here is um, if you haven't already, make sure to get a, a test group spun up and start evaluating it. And, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll definitely have to, um, you know, determine if it's, it's at a good enough quality state for you to move forward. There's several organizations that are moving forward without looking back and, um, you know, happy yeah. with that. And there's others who are definitely encountering uh, some impacts and uh, a lot of scenarios that may be blocked from moving up to it because of hardware compatibility and other issues like that. Um, there's still, uh, I think they had nine specific hardware compatibility issues that were deliberately blocking upgrades to Windows 11, 24H2, aside from just minimum specs. So call that use case number 10. There were nine specific ones, things like 
Um, you know, the uh, fingerprint reader, uh, after upgrading, you wouldn't be able to use the biometrics properly. Other scenarios like that where they've deliberately blocked upgrade paths. So uh, if you are encountering things like that, you may, you may be having one of those specific scenarios that has halted the upgrade for right now. Um, I think, again, we're just seeing a lot of a pretty significant change in the hardware compatibility side to upgrade to this latest one. So that's probably the biggest concern that I've seen most people having. Yeah, unlike last the last couple operating system upgrades we've seen on Windows 11, this is this is significant. There are a lot of new features, a lot of new functionality in there. As Chris mentioned, a lot of new hardware requirements as well. Um, the same operating system kernel, by the way, is also used for Server 2025, which is the reason it's the next long-term service channel update. So. Uh, again, uh, it is a rip and replace, essentially, when you upgrade to the latest Windows 11 24H2 operating system. You will require the full ISO or, or whatever mechanism you're using there. This is not a, uh, and it's going to take a little while to update, so keep that in mind as well. Right. Um, on Server 25, one more final item here. There, several people encountered a, hey, I upgraded, but now it's telling me I need a different license for this. So do check into the license requirements and make sure that your license level covers the upgraded 2025 um, before you pull the trigger on moving forward. Um, I think the auto upgrade to 2025 caught some people by surprise and they didn't have the right license level and they were pretty upset about the fact that they got accidentally forced up and then were at a point where their license level did not apply. Um, so check on that as well before you go upgrading to 2025. Make sure that your your organization's licensing accounts for that, or if you need to do any additional purchases there. Uh, and yes, the the 2025 server upgrade issue should not be an issue going forward. Again, I think uh, I don't know if we caught said it out loud here for the whole audience, but Avanti products should not have been affected by that. We've um, we've you know not heard any reports about that, and from what we understand, the issues were our products would not have captured that um, uh, auto upgrade uh, scenario and pushed it as an optional update. Um, it's only in the cases of like Windows Update and WSUS and third parties that are using those under the hood if they were configured to do that optional update path. Um, it sounds like Microsoft made a change there and several of the vendors who were running into that have also been looking at how to make sure to prevent that as well. Um, but yeah, I think it'll die down here shortly, but it was a rather surprising spike in, in um, impacts that I think people were not prepared for. All right, I think we are probably wrapped up for this month then. Um, I think so. Thank you everyone for joining as well. One more Patch Tuesday to wrap up the year. So we will see you next month for the December, December Patch Tuesday. Thank you all and we'll talk to you soon. Bye everyone.